the Congo River, a pounding pulse across Africa. The deepest river in the world, home to untold, untamed creatures. bubbles like a baby. He is the Congo. Trekking 5,000 kilometers across Central Africa, he grows stronger, brazen, ferocious. Only the Amazon River moves more water, but the Congo is the world's deepest. Locals call him Shambeshi. He answers to many names, takes on different identities, touches countless lives. Each November, this river hosts Central Africa's most swinging party. The largest mammal migration on Earth starts slowly. These straw-colored fruit bats fly in from all over Central Africa and gather in one grove. Swarms of hundreds become hundreds of thousands, then up to 10 million. These unconventional conventioneers pass up food in their mad rush to get here, a place called Kasanka. Like a Roman orgy, they come to gorge themselves and mate. They cram together for safety and warmth, forming one of the largest fruit bat colonies in the world. of bats, tight as roof tiles, roost in an area that would cover just 60 football fields. Quiet comes to Kasanka again. As the sky brightens, this latecomer brushes his teeth and goes to bed. At twilight, they get the party started.
the famished animals tear into their buffet. Each night, the 250 gram bats eat twice their weight in fruit, about 6,000 tons worth. With bellies full of mabola plums, wild loquat, and waterberry fruits, the bats add about 10 tons to each tree they cling to. In 10 weeks, they've picked the grove clean. Party over. The bats move on, spreading seeds on their trip home. Everything goes back to normal just before Christmas. But there's nothing normal about the Congo River, who begins his journey in Zambia, South Central Africa. Here, north of Kasanka, the Congo suckled by Bangveulu, one of the largest marshes on Earth. The Bangveulu wetlands cover an area half the size of Belgium. Seventeen rivers feed it, but only one drains it. Kedende, the local language. Bangveulu means where the water meets the sky. Wildlife thrives here. Just as the Bangviulu feeds the Congo, fish from these waters feed about 50,000 Zambians. Locals build fishing camps deep in the swamps, reachable only by wooden pirogue boats. Papyrus plants grow thick, creating a mini marshland jungle five meters tall. In this jungle, the major predator isn't a lion, but a giant bird. The shoebill, he stands 1.4 meters tall, and if his bill were a real shoe, it'd be about a man size three and a half. but he's really a sneaker. Waiting for prey, he can stand for hours, motionless as a gargoyle. 
Near the floor of the papyrus forest, weavers brood by the water. The picky chicks assert their independence and want nothing to do with this worm. A few meters up, in the top-heavy papyrus canopy, other weavers start families of their own. The males build their love nests to attract a mate, and if she likes it, she'll move in and redecorate the nursery. But every motion starts the cradle rocking, until disaster strikes, flinging a little one out of its nest. The weaver chick, too young to fly, drops in on the shoe bill for lunch. Unfortunately for the weavers, Bangveolu's shoe bills will always be hot on their heels. Below the surface of the marsh, the roots of the papyrus jungle reach back in time to the domain of a creature that first settled here almost 400 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs. Like the papyrus plants, the African lungfish spans two worlds. This fish has gills, but it still needs air every half hour. Otherwise, it'll drown. Unlike most fish, it has a primitive lung. And what's more, it can perform a truly breathtaking feat. When the dry season comes and water turns to puddles and puddles turn into mud, the African lungfish finds himself in the thick of it. That's okay. The secret to lungfish longevity starts with a drought-defying burrow in the mud. About 25 centimeters below the surface, the fish spews mucus. It solidifies to form a cocoon-like shelter that traps moisture and lets in air. The lungfish enters estivation. While most animals burn fat for energy to keep alive, the lungfish digests muscle in its tail. It can survive for months until the season changes. And salvation comes raining down upon it.
Just a few days of rain changes everything, plunging Bangveulu underwater again. As the ground starts to soften, the lungfish rise like zombies all over the place. If need be, they could have waited two years or more. They climb back to the real world with help from their modified finger-like fins and hit the water. Then a quick trip to the surface for a refreshing gulp of air. But maybe this fella should have stayed in bed. The lungfish waited months to breathe again. Now he awakens to a world of familiar dangers. Adapted for life in and out of the water, he's built for survival. But then, so's the shoe bill. Almost before the Congo River has even begun, the thirsty Bangveulu swamp sucks up 90% of its water, keeping it in perpetual second place to the mighty Amazon. Most of the water flowing into the marshland evaporates or gets absorbed by plants. The 10% that's left leaves the swamps here as a single river, Luapula. The Congo River wanders like a roving teenager, traipsing across Africa to find himself. He makes his way into the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a country inaccessible to most and dangerous to many. The river starts at a height of 1,000 meters, It snakes through the acacia trees of the African bushland, which provide a comfortable habitat for guys like this. The African rock python, the biggest snake on the continent and one of the largest in the world. Over his 20 year lifespan, he'll never stop growing and could reach up to seven meters He lacks venomous fangs, but the constrictor's deadly embrace does the trick.
He can even sneak up and crush a full-grown monkey caught napping. But today, no such luck. If need be, he'll hang out inconspicuously on the tree for hours. Right now, the action's on the ground, where helmeted guinea fowl scratch for a meal of their own. This small family mob searches for seeds, worms, and insects. They're also on constant lookout for danger, ready to squawk at the slightest threat. One would make a nice snack for the python, but predator and prey don't seem to notice each other. Two days later, the snake is still hungry. He's in the middle of molting, his smooth scales turning flaky. And until the scales fall from his eyes, it's as if he's looking through a plastic shopping bag. He sniffs out a path to the river. Nothing like a cool bath to soothe dry, flaky skin. The guinea fowl, which never live far from the water, head there too. They're hard to miss. The snake could be in luck. The guinea fowl huddle together, a squawking, formidable mob. The python can probably feel the vibration on the ground, but his blurred vision keeps him from locking onto just one to call dinner. The guinea fowl aren't defenseless. If pressed, they'll gang up and attack the snake. In his current state, he's at a real disadvantage. The peeling python backs down. No matter how hungry he might get, during the molt, this hunter's off his game. All the more reason to hit the water and soak off that skin. A molting snake is a vulnerable snake. At least he still has his tongue to sniff with, for now. At some point, even his tongue will shed but by then he'll be able to see again. In just a few days, he'll be rid of his scales and back in business, and very hungry. Traveling through the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the river goes by the name Lualaba. About 2,000 kilometers from its birthplace, the wide and lazy river hastens its pace, crosses the equator, and plunges over the edge of the world. The Boyoma Falls mark the end the river's untamed course. From this point on, nature and commerce share the water. On the other side of the Boyoma Falls, the wayward river reaches maturity, becomes navigable, and is at last called the Congo. The city of Kisangani, directly downriver of the falls, marks the start of a 1,700-kilometer trade route to Kinshasa, the capital. The ancient and the modern converge when the fishermen 
from the Vigania tribe come into the city and sell their catch. The fishermen, who live by the rapids, have tied their fate to the fast-flowing waters. For centuries, the Vigania have built large wooden frames to hang their traditional braided fish traps. Hundreds of kilometers of dense jungle thicket borders these banks. Further north, jungle surrenders to savanna and becomes Garamba National Park. The watershed that forms the park's northern border feeds the Congo and his sister, the Nile. Garamba, three times the size of Los Angeles, is one of Africa's first national parks, established by Belgium in 1938. But decades of civil war and poaching have not been kind to the inhabitants. This open grassland, which attracts huge numbers of animals, invites an even swifter enemy. fire comes to Garamba, the breeze can whip the flames into frenzy. But the news isn't all bad. The blaze is a boom to yellow-billed kites, which flock to catch insects fleeing the fire. It's a risky mission. it satisfies a hankering for a lightly toasted locust. Like rain, or the ebb and flow of the Garamba River, Fire is simply part of the savanna's rhythm. During the current dry season, the riverbed pokes through. And that means cramped quarters for the 2,000 or so hippos living here. A single bull rules each herd. But when the water's this low and space gets tight, tensions build. And to top it off, this bull's looking to mate. His age and size wins him the top mating spot. He picks the best place to impress the cows and secure his dominance. Hippos spend most of the day keeping cool in the water. They're buoyant and can walk along the bottom, but can't really swim. The bull parks himself by the bank where he can mate without the cows getting in over their heads. When he wants to mark his territory, the poop hits the fan. He makes his point among the herd. When dusk falls, the hungry herd wants to leave the water to graze. 
but the stubborn old bull blocks their way. A young upstart moves in to challenge his authority and take the boss down a peg. Game on. The challenger faces off against the old bull. The unhappy hippo holds his ground. His rival retreats. The old bull, proving he's still the chief hippo in charge, confidently lumbers onto land. The others hesitate, respecting his space. Eventually, they'll follow his lead. They'll eat their fill of grasses, then return to the water before sunrise. In other parts of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, hippos face extinction, hunted and poached for meat and illegal ivory from their teeth. Here, the garamba's remoteness protects them. The Garamba River winds its way hundreds of kilometers through the savannah before heading back into the jungle and joining the Congo. Here, the mighty river grows wider and more powerful, a superhighway fed by hundreds of tributaries that sand and sediment hitch a ride on. Over the centuries, the Congo has grabbed it to build elaborate sandcastles. The largest, is almost as big as Munich. The towering island of sediment stands like a fortress. Small streams manage to cut into the remote center, but they pay a toll. Along the way, the jungle plants steal almost all the nutrients in the water.
This is an island of small, highly specialized creatures. Cut off from the nourishing waters of the Congo, the residents of this nutritional desert had to evolve cunning ways to scare up a decent meal. The African butterfly fish gets its name from its wing-like pectoral fins. But this little fish owes its life to the shape of its body. Its flat, straight back lets it sneak close to the surface, hunting without sticking out. Its eyes focus ahead and above, not down and to the sides like most fish. That lets it lurk under the foliage with its eye trained on what's above. Things are looking up for the butterfly fish. The Congo Basin is the world's second largest rainforest. Many plants and animals in the basin live nowhere else on Earth. But this is no perfect paradise. Just like any place else, the law of the jungle never changes. Kill or be killed. The African mantis, a hunter by stealth, survives by blending in. The taxicab beetle, named for its markings, doesn't realize he's about to pick up a fatal fare. The mantis lost the battle, but not the war. Months ago, she laid a walnut-sized egg sac by the banks of the stream. Hundreds of freshly hatched mantis nymphs greet the world, each the size of an ant. Very few of the nymphs will reach adulthood. If food is scarce, they may even devour each other. While the butterfly fish patrols the surface, the eel catfish prowls the lower depths.
But this catfish is no ordinary bottom feeder. If it can't find food in the water, it'll dine out. It's flexible in another remarkable way, too. An extraordinarily supple spine enables the eel catfish to bend its head down to eat, a trick most fish can't muster. This kind of evolutionary breakthrough helped vertebrates conquer the land. The Congo Basin is like a giant lab for evolution. The dense rainforest and the river's depth, speed, and rugged landscape keep species apart so they adapt unique ways to thrive in small niches. West of Kisangani, the Congo River embraces hundreds of sand islands over the next 1,700 kilometers. Dense forest thickets grow right up to the water's edge. This is the Zanga River as it merges into the Congo. Even in a part of the world brimming with life, the Zanga rainforest takes the prize with more species of plants and animals than almost anywhere else. Besides providing an all-you-can-eat salad bar to gorillas and others, rainforests generate more than 20% of the world's oxygen. In a forest of herbivores, plants need to defend themselves. They wage a bitter battle by tasting bad or being toxic or hard to digest. Sometimes it works, but in the war between plants and animals, one heavyweight has a secret weapon. Along the Sangha River, the dense and seemingly endless jungle gives way to a huge clearing, the Jungabai, the village of elephants. Forest dwellers travel far to visit this dusty 125 square meter plain. Unlike most elephants, these African forest elephants have almost completely straight tusks to keep from getting tangled in the dense forest. The wide open space, or even the water, aren't what draws them here. They've come to Jangabai for one thing, the mud. Jungabai is like a spa, with minerals and salts the animals need for their health, but can't get enough of from the plants or the water. The minerals in the mud also neutralize caustic compounds in some of the plants they eat, an antidote to their poison.
The elephants squabble over the best places. It's not just the large ones who bicker. The young want their share too. Mothers and their calves try to keep clear of the commotion while still managing to scarf up their minerals. The grass also contains the nutrients the elephants need. This young calf could use a bit of practice. Those who haven't mastered the grass cutting technique simply vacuum up the minerals from the surface. Here, it's perfectly okay if the kids eat dirt. Elephants aren't the only foodies to find this spot. They're just the biggest. There's plenty of dirt to go around. As the Congo ripples and roars over its 4,800 kilometer course, changing everything in its path, it can often be harsh, but it always takes care of those tough enough to survive.